Welcome to the Doggy Dojo. I'm your host, Susan Light, a Los Angeles-based dog trainer on a quest to become worthy of the title Sensei of the Doggy Dojo. Today we're talking about something absolutely every pet parent should think about, cooperative care, which my guest prefers to call care with consent. If you remember my very first episode, Train Your Dog to Love Grooming, with the amazing Stephanie Zickman, her career is built around cooperative care, where she, the groomer, as a trainer as well, takes it upon herself to teach the dog's cooperative care in the grooming relationship. But having a dog you don't have to wrestle to trim their nails or give a bath to is nice and a worthy goal. But care with consent goes far beyond this. My guest today is the owner of Decisive Moment Pet Consulting and has been a professional dog trainer for 18 years. Currently, she is a certified dog behavior consultant with IAABC, a CPDTKSA, fear-free certified professional level one elite and certified trainer, low stress handling certified fit pause master trainer and tag teach level three. She specializes in care with consent, human directed aggression, resource guarding, helping senior dogs thrive and living with intact dogs. In addition to decisive moment pet consulting, she is also an animal trainer at Synergy Behavior Solutions, a veterinary behavior practice. I'm pleased to welcome Sarah McLaudry. Welcome, Sarah, to the podcast. Thanks. Um, so we're going to talk about care with consent, which is, tell me why you use care with consent instead of, I think, the more common phrase, um, cooperative care. Yeah. So the it's it, it took me a little while to get there. I used to call it cooperative care, and I do still use that word interchangeably sometimes. But the reason I really switched to the term care with consent is there are some times where we are doing things with our pets, our animals, that isn't always consensual or isn't always cooperative, but is still consensual. And that's a really important distinction. There's time, like, so I think about a, you know, I, a dog that I train to have a sedated exam and has human directed aggression and issues at the vet in general, and we taught him how to be restrained. It was not completely cooperative because he couldn't stand there independently mm. and hold that position and they have nobody, you know, just come in and do the, the injection, but it was completely consensual. He knew what was going to happen. We trained every part of it. He still had ways of saying no and stopping the procedure, even though it wasn't completely cooperative. And okay. I think so often when we talk about cooperative care, it's held up on this pedestal of your dog has to do a chin rest and hold still while all this stuff happens or, you know, whatever it might look like for you and your pet. And that always isn't always practical, depending on what needs to be done in the veterinary setting or even in the grooming setting sometimes. And what is where the training is with the pet or the training skills of the person who is, owns the pet. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. So then does that mean that your focus is more on a stop button behavior than a start button behavior? I do both. I think okay. it's really important to, and so like with the, giving that example of this dog that was tra uh, trained restraint, we call it squish, which is stand up against the wall. And we're going to literally physically squish you up against the wall, but all of it is trained. So mm -hmm. his start behavior was you would stand next to the wall in position. And if he did not get into position on his own, then we wouldn't start. So there's still, even though it's not totally cooperative, in the long run, it still is cooperative in many, many components of it. So let's define for everybody that's listening in case, <laughs> in case people are like, oh my God, I'm already lost. I yeah. don't know what you guys are talking about. Um, <laughs> let's go back and talk about what do we mean by start button and, and yeah. stop button behavior? Or even go back to what is cooperative, cooperative care. care. Oh yeah. yeah. And so for me, um, cooperative care started actually with my now 12 year old American water spaniel. And she came to me as a baby puppy with a lot of body handling issues. And she was going to be my show dog. And I was like, um, this is a problem. 
I'm not going to be able to let strange people touch my dog. And, and she was really friendly. She didn't have issues with people. She just had issues with some body touching and handling. And so I taught her a chin rest to hold still while the judge examined her. And that was kind of my first foray into choosing to be part of the game and that cooperative side of it. And then we went on to teach a lot of different skills for her in the veterinary setting. So I always tell when the average person who doesn't understand this or doesn't believe what we can do, I always say, go look at the videos on YouTube from the zoos, you know, Mm, go look at the polar bear sticking their paw in the x-ray machine holder and go watch the jugular blood draws on the different animals. And um, I spent a week at the shed aquarium a number of years ago watching all of their staff work with the animals. And it really opens your eyes up to what can be done cooperatively. If you can have a beluga whale lay upside down and put his fluke in your lap and get a blood draw, there's no reason we can't stop manhandling our pets. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, I think think a lot of people, um, it's a completely foreign concept to them. Yeah, because this is training that a lot of owners don't do. You see it done more with trainers training mm-hmm. their own dogs. Most trainers' dogs are trained in cooperative care, um, and a lot of regular dogs aren't because yeah. people don't see the value in it. But there's so much more value in cooperative care than than basic obedience. Yes. To be honest, yes, yeah, and I think about how often, um, you know dogs who are uncomfortable at the vet, how it affects even the client choosing to call the vet if there's an issue. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and I and I know that I've had that situation myself. Um, last year, I lost my, my middle dog um, from cancer. But while we were going through that, he had a lot of veterinary handling issues. And it always was like, okay, how much stress is this going to be for him? And we always had a way out his treatment kind of in relation to his veterinary phobia. Yeah. So we, when we're talking about cooperative care or care with consent, yeah. um, what kinds of things are we talking about? So you mentioned blood draws and veterinary procedures, uh, but we can also do like grooming procedures, yeah. right? Like teeth brushing, nail clipping, those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Is there yeah, any and- limit to what we can train this way? I haven't found one. And I've <laughs> dealt with some pretty severe, because I also, um, I spent almost uh, five and a half years as the head of training at Synergy Behavior Solutions. So we would get cases there that were pretty severe um, in their danger level to the veterinary staff. Mm. And um, so I've trained, um, you know, some pretty impressive stuff. The I think a lot of it is limited by your imagination. Um, people frequently ask me how I got into dog training and you know, every, every dog trainer ends up here, I think most of us, because we had a bad dog. Um, yeah. So, yeah. But, um, which is what of course happened to me, but my background is actually, I have a, a fine arts degree in photography from, a, from art school. And um, it makes me see the world a little differently. And so it really is about looking at things sometimes just different than what your average vet tech, not average vet tech, that sounds derogatory, Um, (laughs) what traditionally is done in a clinic. Okay. And sometimes you just need to look at things differently and be like, okay, well, how can we do this another way? So where do you start? My first, when I teach my group classes, my first thing that I start with actually is I call it um, the chili bowl because you're supposed to just chill out next to it. And it's actually just a bowl of treats. Can you be calm and relaxed with a bowl of treats nearby you so that I can not have to worry about that? That's literally where I start because so many dogs, as soon as you get out the treats are like, how about I do this and sit and down and spin and, Mm -hmm. you know, all of these things. So it's like, first is like, can we just be in our bodies and relax? I love (laughs) that you call it the chili bowl. I call it the bucket game. Well, it's different than the bucket game. Okay. So the bu- yeah. So that's actually a great question. So the bucket game is really a start and a stop button of if, I, if you're looking at the bucket, I'm ready to play the game. And the chili bowl mm. is just that the bowl is nearby and I can give you treats from it and you shouldn't mug it and steal treats out of it and things like that. But they don't need to look at it. Okay. And so it is still a predictor cue that we are going to do cooperative care. 
So in my case, one of my chili bowls is actually a little um, jelly jar. And as soon as I grab that jelly jar, my young dog runs to the door of the bathroom because we do a lot of our cooperative care in my bathroom because it's boring. Mm -hmm. And um, she, as soon as I pick up that jar, the predictor cue has started. She's like, oh, we're going to do nails or we're going to do whatever it is that we do. And so it's a little bit different than a, a Shireg Patel's bucket game. Okay. And what do you do if your dog is just absolutely crazy around the treats? <laughs> I have one of those also. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have a spaniel. Enough said. Yep, um, yep. The, uh, I mean, part of it is also, I like for her, I keep it up higher and, you know, work on that. Um, but I still want the same, I use the same bowl and the same item as a predictor cue of what's going to happen. She knows that when I pick up that same jelly jar, she, she, ah, so there's our care with consent versus cooperative care. She is, has struggles with her nails and she does not lay down and beautifully pick her feet up to put her paw in my hand for nails. Like my young dog does. I do have to physically, I pick her up and put her on her back and rest her on my chest. And she does them with her, her back to me. And then I can do them, but she can't get into that position without me. So that's a good example of care with consent versus cooperative care. I still have a bunch of stop signals within that, that game. And she knows that when I grab that jar, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. So all of this sounds incredibly nuanced. Yes. <laughs> You've got to be really plugged into your dog and all of the signals that they're giving, uh, which is why I do think it's good and why most trainers do this. And general owners don't. Yeah. Um, if you are a general owner and you haven't studied dog body language, it's probably good to at least start this under the guidance of a trainer. Yes. And it really, I think um, clients that have taken my, I love when um, puppy people take my cooperative care classes. Um, I think it teaches you so much more about body language and it does make you so much more in tune to what is going on so that you see things with other behaviors, if you're out walking or, you know, whatever it might be with your dog. Um, I think you're, it's very right. It is, can be very nuanced. Um, and it really takes the time to be present too. You really need to be aware of what you're doing. Yeah. Well, even the difference between the chili bowl and the bucket game, yeah. I mean, those are nuances that, you know, you're not just going to automatically, I didn't even get and you had to explain them to me, you know, like it's nuanced. It's nuanced, you guys. Yeah. And, and the reason I don't use the bucket game, I use the chili bowl versus the bucket game. And Deb Jones calls, like, I think she calls it the Zen bowl. Um, and I just, I don't like using religions as part of my <laughs> naming process. Um, and so the, um, the difference is too, is for some pe for some dogs, really heavily food motivated dogs, yeah. they will stare at that bucket because the food is in the bucket. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean they're cooperating or consenting. The yeah. food drive is overriding their ability to say no, thank you. And so that's the main difference that I use for, for that. I do have some games where it is stare at food, um, but it's just a little bit different. Okay. Um, so what is a, I guess I'm, I'm back to, to where do you start? So we'd start with the chili game and then do you want to teach a start button behavior? Tend, do you want to start with the stop button behavior? I actually, for most dogs, their start and stop buttons for most dogs, they develop on their own. Okay. And that goes back to, like you said, that nuanced observing skills is really important. And so usually the first exercise we teach is actually a lot of clients have like a shaker give paw behavior. They te taught it cute little trick, um, but it's very different than what you would need for cooperative care because it's usually a quick little tap and get out. And so that's one of the first things I teach is to start adding duration to the dog choosing to put their hand in your, their paw in your hand mm -hmm. and not you grab. So this also becomes training for the person because we are grabby creatures. Yeah. <laughs> we have these digits we like to grab with. And so really working on like flat hand for the client and the dog choosing to put their paw in the hand and how can I feed in a calm, slow manner that keeps that paw in the hand without me grabbing it and making it happen. Okay. 
And it's really interesting to watch clients lose the grab and mm. start to see, oh, I don't need to grab the paw because the dog is putting it there and keeping it there on their own. And so that's a, it's a really simple skill. That's a pretty aha moment. And we don't do anything with touching nails yet or clippers or anything like that. It's just like, can that paw get held in your hand by choice? Okay. Cause I was going to say, then do you need a separate start button behavior for different uh, behaviors that you're looking for. For instance, like the squish against the wall, that's mm -hmm. so specific, handing mm -hmm. the nail, handing the hand for the nails. You know, I had always been taught like the side lying position. Yes. You know, cause you can do a lot of things from that mm -hmm. position or center with a chin rest yep. Yep. kinds of things. So do you attempt to teach the dog, all the dogs, all these things? Yeah. And so I, I think of it more conceptual. And I think okay. once the dogs start learning the concept that they can control the situation. Cause I actually also, I, I talk about pause buttons too, cause I really strongly believe that there's pause buttons in addition to start and stop buttons. Okay. And I feel so often with the reason why I said they frequently develop on their own is once the dogs learn, like, so in that case of the, the paw, the stop button would be the dog taking their paw away from your hand. And instead of you grabbing for it, it can. And the dog, exactly. it's amazing to watch the dogs be like, what? You didn't grab me. And like, you see this little, like, I always joke that, like, I always pretend like there's a Rolodex cards in dogs' brains. Um, <laughs> and they put the little Rolodex card in their brain going, ooh, that mm. worked. Um, yeah. And so then they start to realize like, oh, in that side lay down position, if I pick my head up, maybe they'll pause right. for a second you know? And, yeah. um, so yes, I think, so, and it all depends on what behaviors you need. And that's where the creativity part comes in. I just finished train. We just got a, a, like one of the, my most proud moments. We just got a successful blood draw on, um, a dog with a, a long history of some pretty dangerous behaviors in the vet setting. Mm -hmm. And we had a, we taught him a side lay down rear leg blood draw with a tourniquet. <laughs> Wow. And that was about being creative and just looking outside the box because he had a great stand stay, but his, all of his veterinary phobia started um, with him sitting on a thermometer. Oh, buddy. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and that so, wouldn't do it for anybody. I mean, exactly. I mean, it totally makes sense. <laughs> um, and so with he was very suspicious understandably about yep. people coming up from behind him what you doing back there yeah, yep. exactly and we didn't want to do a jugular blood draw or front leg blood draw because he will even though he was muzzled he still will go lunge forward and snap and bite um he's obviously not hurting anybody because he is muzzled but it's still it's a little startling yeah. and so we didn't really want anybody up at his face but he wasn't being comfortable holding still standing for this rear leg blood draw mm. and so we decided he had a great side lay down and so we that's what we ended up doing and then we added in the tourniquet to take away um from extra people handling him um mm. but oh god we totally got distracted all right so good example there actually another so a start button for him or a stop button is actually eating so he is food motivated but he, when we started the process of training, he couldn't eat in that situ those situations sure. or he would, it would be very frantic. It was like crazy frantic eating. Mm -hmm. And so um, now he can lay down on his side and he gets a little squeezy tube of peanut butter the whole time that everything's happening to him, but it's not a distraction. It's actually just a reward because he wasn't tolerating distraction before. There was no way you could have gotten that behavior done with just with peanut distraction. Butter. Yeah. 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 So you're, you're saying his stop button was he stopped eating. You knew he was stressed. Yep. Or um, we talk about those little subtle things. We also, um, if his tail moves, because his tail's kind of down anyway, because he was on Medicaid, pre-visit pharmaceutical medications. But if he would ever so slightly tuck his tail, like basically we'd always have one person in the room on tail watch. 
We're going to take a short break, but you can find Sarah on Facebook and Instagram by either clicking on the links in the show notes or searching Decisive Moment Pet Consulting or check out her website, DecisiveMomentConsulting.com. We'll be right back. Yeah. Um, so that that's hard to get that level of commitment from a lot of people. Yeah. But hopefully your dog doesn't need that level of training right. either. Right. And so that's where I, I would really like to get more veterinary hospitals and trainers on board with, can we do this sooner in a dog's life so that we can have the dog understanding the start and stop signals at a young age Yeah. so that they have these positive experiences. So, you know, not every visit to the vet is something bad happens to them. Yeah. Um, and so all of those are so critically important. Yeah. How do you decide if, because uh, I, I did an episode about shy and fearful dogs and we talked about mm-hmm. this and it's very tricky when you're trying to desensitize dogs to things that they're afraid of. And, you know, we talked mm-hmm. about specifically that whole, like, oh, just take the dog to the vet right. often and let them get used to it. And she's like, you know, in, in my opinion, that could pro- probably be flooding where yes. you're just flooding them and they're just shutting down. They're not actually starting to feel better about it. Right. So um, do you have kind of a, a rule of thumb or a, a sort of guidance in that situation? Yeah. Of how do we keep it from being flooding and we get it to be a positive desensitization experience? So this once again goes back to those small little details. Yeah. And so with most of my clients, I it's not unusual that they get anxious and, and most people are like, oh, my dog knows exactly when we're going to go to the vet. Because we give off the vet vibes, you know, and so, (laughs) and so I always say like, okay, how is the car ride? Mm. Oh, the car ride's good. At what point does your dog realize they're going to the vet? Is it, you know, back in the house? Is it the car ride? Is it when you pull into the parking lot? Like that's where we start. And I have a game called parking lots and puppuccinos Mm. and (laughs) parking lots and puppuccinos is depending on where your dog, so let's say your dog four blocks away from the vet clinic starts to get worried. You're going to start go driving and you're going to stop seven blocks away mm. and you're going to hang out and you're going to give them treats. Judge, are they okay? Are they comfortable? Are they taking treats? All's going well. No overt stress signs. We're going to drive one block closer. Mm. How's it going? Feed some treats, do the same thing, slowly getting closer to and stopping before the stress happens. And then you drive home and you get a puppuccino on the way home. Mm. Every single time you get a puppuccino on the way home. And because we, if we think about it, it's not just going into the clinic. It's the whole process. Mm-hmm. It's the pheromones of every stressed dog that has peed in the parking lot. Mm. It is, you know, your dog is smelling that a block away. <laughs> Mm, you know, yeah. we, we have to really, I talk a lot with my clients about the scent picture of a clinic. Um, I'm a nose work nerd. And so that's part of it too. Um, but so we yeah, have parking lots and puppuccinos makes a really big difference of like, we're not even going to make it. We might not even make it to the parking lot. I had one client that spent three weeks before they even got to the parking lot and yeah. they did it like a couple times a week. And then the dog knew like, okay, well, we're just going to the parking lot. We're going to eat some treats and we're going to drive and go get a puppuccino. This is a great thing. Yeah. Um, and that's where, and so that's what, to avoid that flooding component. I love that. I love that. And yeah. I'd also, parking lot and puppuccinos, dogs love it. I'd also like to point out that, and this, I wish we could just scream from the rooftops because a lot of the best dog training looks like nothing. Yes. Like you tell me this exercise and I can see a lot of owners being like, that's dumb. They're not doing anything. Like we're just going to drive around in the car and keep the dog comfortable. Like, do you know what I mean? Right. But let one, me tell and you. one client totally did. And it was funny because <laughs> that she's the one that took like three weeks and she's like, this is ridiculous. And she's like, and then all of a sudden, like two, three months down the line, she's like, oh my God, she just like jumps in the car. I never even realized that she like wasn't jumping in the car before. And like, yeah, she hadn't noticed some of the bigger stressors that this dog was having until we started giving the dog pup. And then I have another client like, is it safe to give them puppuccinos? I'm like, 
it's not their whole diet. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. But I, I love this. And I love, uh, you know, this, this is, it's like the same with the chili bowl. Like a lot of these things that we're talking about are going to sound like you're giving your dogs treats for nothing. Right. And I've had clients tell me that they're like, what? You're just giving them treats for nothing. What are you teaching them? Yeah. And you, it's, uh, you got to reframe the whole way you're thinking about this because yeah. it's not you sit, you get a treat. You know, this is approaching emotionally how they're approaching their life. Um, super. Yeah. Important. And especially with, you know, the clinic setting is, you know, if we can reduce that, if they think every time they leave the clinic, they're going for a puppuccino. You know, I remember when I was a kid and our dog learned that going to the bank meant it got a biscuit, Aww. you know? And so yeah. like, you know, and I, and, and if you can, if the dog knows that when you show up the bank, they get a biscuit and they love going to the bank, there's no reason we can't do the same thing with a puppuccino at the vet clinic. Yeah. Yeah. The power of Excuse me, predictability sorry. and uh, good old Pavlov hanging out. I love it. So let's talk about the importance of predictability in care with consent. Is it, you've already started it, but uh, yeah, let's touch on that more. Okay. So predictability can be your very best friend when it comes to care with consent, and it can be your biggest enemy. Mm. And so let's talk about the enemy side of it first. So dogs learn very quickly. Yeah. Why are they out in the parking lot of the clinic? Something bad is going to go happen in that building. People wearing white coats mean bad things happen. Um, when the tech is in here, it's fine. I get cookies when the tech leaves and two people walk in the door, bad things happen. Mm. Um, muzzle plus spray cheese equals bad things happening. Mm. You know, these are all examples that I have with clients. Um, you know, so dogs vary, uh, the smell of peanut butter because they've only ever had peanut butter in a clinic setting. You know, all of these things become the predictors of something bad is going to happen. And that's where if we can start being aware of the power of predictability and harness the power, we can make such a big difference. So simple things like when, I, when I'm working in a clinic setting with a dog, re, it's not unusual actually that I will have clients actually switch clinics, not because their clinic did anything wrong, but the predictability just of the whole clinic setting mm, has sleep. become so, yeah, has been so corrupted that we just changing. Yeah. And so we start new in the parking lot and build from there. Mm. And I always like, we talk about predictability and patterns going in. So I use a lot of Leslie McDevitt's pattern games going into the clinic. Mm -hmm. So a lot of one, two, three counting games. Um, I've used Super Bowls. Some different things like that work really well for going in the clinic. And then, especially with COVID, we did a lot of those games with COVID dogs. And then I want even what, how you walk in to be predictable. You come in, you go to your scale, you get your treats on the scale, you go, and especially if it's a dog that has a history of some problems, the same room even. And you might not, eventually I would like to not have it always be the same room and the same tech, but at first we're going to do the same room and the same tech mm. because I want that everybody knows the game, you know, and the dog knows. Um, so sometimes that first time when they go in, I, I, I don't want a tech in there at all, but I'll have a tech place a pre-filled snuffle mat in the exam room. And it's a snuffle mat that the dog already, it's their own snuffle mat. The client has conditioned it outside of the vet setting. And it's amazing when they come in and they're worried, worried, worried. And then they see their snuffle mat on the ground and they're like, oh, mm. this place has snuffle mats? <laughs> oh, maybe it's not so bad after all. And they just get a little distracted. They get a ton of treats from the snuffle mat and you leave. Mm. And that's that predictability again. I'm like, they know they've had that snuffle mat a hundred times with a bunch of yummy treats in it. And it overrides, frequently it will override some of that concern also because there's nobody in the room and there's no pressure. Um, there's a couple, there's like two camps in predictability with actual procedures. Um, one camp is, like a single predictor of what's going to happen. And then I am of the camp where the more predictors, the better. And so we're doing a vaccine. We're going to say hand or touch or whatever you want to call it. That means somebody's going to touch your skin right now. Then it's going to be a pinch of I'm going to touch your skin right now. And then it's going to be a poke and I'm going to poke you and something is going to feel great. Mm. One of the reasons 
the side that we give the dogs the predictors and they know what's going to happen next and obviously we train each one of those steps is it also slows the text down to help us see if we need to stop mm. because so often they're just like tent to skin poke it go doom boom boom because they just go into their routine which is great that's what that's their job they should have they should be able to do their job without having to think too much about giving a basic vaccine yeah but for a dog who might have problems with that, slowing the procedure down can really be helpful. And that's where those predictor cues can also help with the people. Mm -hmm. So how do you get, right now, I can't go into my vet. Yeah, I got to drop Oh, you them. still have, you still have a curbside clinic. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So dropping them, you know, and then they're, they're bringing them back out to the car. So, yeah. um, We've let's seen a lot of fallout from that. Well, let's assume though that, you know, cause like you said, you have the option to go find another clinic. Uh, right. So how do you get your vet to buy into this for you and your vet techs to give you all this access to an empty <laughs> exam room so you can just come in and snuff them at and leave? Um, how right. do you get that level of cooperation? Usually when we have a dog who is problematic at the clinic, it's a safety issue for their staff. And so that's first off, we're, we're, our goal is to make their job easier. Like that's what I always tell vets and the techs is my job is to make your job easier. It may take a little bit slower, but you're going to be safer and it's going to be easier on you. So that's like one buy-in factor right there. The other buy-in factor is safety must be first. Mm. Most people, when they want to do, like when I talked about like that up on the pedestal cooperative care, it's like no muzzle, no nothing, no hands-on. And yeah, that's great. Like, and my dogs can do some pretty amazing stuff like that. But I want that dog muzzle trained because yeah. we need to make sure our techs are, and our vets are safe first and foremost. And that's where you can get a lot more buy-in to less restraint if you have a muzzle on. Even if, you're, if, if you could swear up and down <laughs> that your dog will never bite anybody, the it still just reduces everybody's anxiety to put that muzzle on yeah, and have the dog be comfortable. So that's yeah. another buy-in factor. And then the other thing that I do for a lot of clinics is I do a ton of videotaping of the practices and the training sessions and show them what it's going to look like. Because so often they just, like you said, like most pet parents don't, they don't have any idea that this is possible. So many vets and techs don't have any idea that it's possible. Mm. Um, I was at an emergency clinic once with my older dog and she has a unrestrained, completely cooperative jugular blood draw that is phenomenal and I'm very proud of. And I, and she has, you know, these body hand, and I said to the, the vet, we needed to get some blood. It was a sun, of course, late on a Saturday night. And I'm like, well, she has a trained jugular blood draw, blah, blah, blah. I told her all the details. And the vet came back in to do the draw because she wanted to see the behavior. Oh. <laughs> she was so blown away that I even mentioned it. And she's like, I've heard about this, but I've never seen it done. Wow. And so, and then you have a believer. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's the, I think for me, I've, I've been a trainer for 18 years. It's a long time in positive dog training land. Um, I think that's one of the most exciting things about social media is seeing, that's letting people possible. know that, yeah, that like this can happen. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So that's awesome. Uh, I'm excited about that. Yeah. I have two questions and they're a little bit, I think, connected okay. because we're talking about, you know, predictability and how it yep. can go wrong, you know, if we do it wrong. Um, so you had mentioned a corrupt cue and yes. I feel like that's wrapped up in what I really want to ask you, which is the question I get all the time when I'm trying to do cooperative care with my clients is, well, what if I, something has to be done before mm -hmm. they're trained to do it cooperatively? Yeah. So I also have a got a cue. <laughs> I have lots of names for lots of things. <laughs> um, so I actually started using the term corrupt cue and I'm glad that you picked that up is it's traditionally what most trainers call a poisoned cue, mm -hmm. but I don't poison. I, I just don't like the sound of it. It sounds bad. And really it's a corrupt cue. You've taken the file, the training file that you installed and you corrupted it somehow. Mm. 
and sometimes it's not intentional. You know, most often it's not intentional. Right. But it's corrupt. Yeah. And so that's why I call it that. And I don't want to ever think about poisoning my dogs. Um, and so the God IQ is a good example. Um, I'm going to use an example. Is So my spaniel has horrible allergies. And every Sunday she has to get a, ba- a medicated bath that she has to be in the tub for 10 minutes with her medicated shampoo on. Mm. And she doesn't like body handling and she doesn't like baths and all of these things. And I was like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do when the vet told me that it had to be a weekly bath now? It's like, you don't understand. <laughs> um, and I'm lucky I have a grooming, t- a grooming tub that has a walk up to it. I have a whole grooming table, but she is in the garage. And so I started noticing that anytime I would take a leash out, she was like, I'm out of here. Mm. Because she started to realize that leash meant that I was probably going to go in the garage and take her to the garage. And so all of these predictor cues started happening. And so what I started to do was the gotta cue was I would get a specific towel that only ever came out for this. So she knew that towel meant we were getting a bath. And it wasn't great, but I would, at that time, I would, at the beginning, I would literally just take this big towel and I would wrap her in it. I'd scoop her up. Luckily, she's only like 35 pounds. And I would take her out to the tub. And then once we got to the tub, she could choose to go into the sta- up the stairs or not. And I would just like hang on to her collar. At, I got rid of the leash. I didn't drag her because she wouldn't eat food in that situation. She's like, I'm, I know what's happening. I'm not going to eat food. And so the, the towel became the predictor of, yes, the bath is going to happen. I'm going to attempt to make the bath as least stressful as possible. So tons of treats and breaks and all these kinds of things. And I also install the heater and all these other things to make it as possible, as comfortable as possible for her. But within, I would say a month, maybe less, um, I was able to get rid of that towel because she, I would just be able to, I started to not, I started to have the towel, but I would just put my finger under her collar and walk her to the door of the garage. And she would willingly walk all the way out to the garage and get up onto the, into the, the tub. Hmm. And it was amazing to watch that, just that predictable pattern of, yeah, she does. She still doesn't like baths, right? but she tolerates them and is much more comfortable doing them. She willingly goes out to, she doesn't bounce and happily go out there. I still take her by her collar, but that predictability of, she knew what was going to happen. She knew how it was going to happen. There was no quick, you know, sneaky things happening, made the world of difference. We know that from early uh, studies back in the seventies with mice, that if you are given a predictor cue before a negative thing happens, in that case, it was shocking them on their feet. um, If you lit the light bulb up to let them know that something was bad was going to happen, their cortisol levels are lower. That's interesting, but it makes sense because it's like when we get shots and things, mm-hmm. you're like, here we go. Yes. You know? And so, and we don't do that with the dog. Yeah. And so, you know, so there, that's why I said it can, so that's where the gotta cue comes in. So like in that case, my gotta cue was, I got to put this towel around you and I got to take you to do a bath and I'm real sorry, but I didn't want to continue to make leashes a problem and, you know, all of these other things and make this whole relationship with her bad. And so there's lots of ways we can put God cues in. Um, one of my clients is working with some car sickness. They, they're, when they're training the car, they have a specific leash and collar and uh, leash and harness that they use that is different than if they have, like, cause we had a setback at one point, like they're doing their car training, dogs doing great. And then the dog got injured and had to go to the vet. And they had to take a car ride yep. and it totally backslid their car behavior. And so we then, that became the, the corrupt leash and collar, whatever one they used then. And we got a whole different setup. And so every time we we're doing training, that was a totally different setup. And that was the predictor cue of like, oh, we're going to take it slow. We're going to go in here. But if we have to go in the car, we're going to go to this piece of equipment. Mm-hmm. And that's where the predictability can you know, the, like I got it. The other thing to the biggest thing I can say too, is if you're in a situation where you gotta talk to your vet about medications. Mm, That's great. Um, but I'm thinking more like mundane things, like I've got to trim their nails. You don't see, that's where like, 
I'm such a like, wow. Well, <laughs> You're like, you know, yeah, I, 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 okay. Exactly. Like, because, you know, I work in a best behavior clinic. Like, really? All right. Um, and yes, you do have to trim nails. And I, I am a, my young dog has amazing nail behavior and I can trim them super short and they don't click on the floor and I'm super proud of it. Um, but if she didn't, um, the, you know, so that, that still you could talk to your vet about medications using medication. I have, uh, we have a lot of patients at the vet behavior clinic that they have to use medications to trim their dog's nails at home. Oh, interesting. Okay. And people think about only using medications when you go to the clinic. But if your dog is ha- struggling with nail trims at home, there's no reason why adding some additional anti-anxiety medications wouldn't, you know, and short acting, you know, but like I said, I'm not a vet. I'll stay in my lane. But it's something to talk about to your, your vet about is that there are options out there um, and there's a variety of options. And so that would be one thing. Um, the other, like I, we have a lot of clients with their, like a, I have a doodle client where grooming is a major issue. We're working on it. And she does sedated grooms at the vet clinic right now. Oh, wow. We've, yeah. We've trained a sedation procedure and the dog now willingly goes in, has her muzzle on, gets sedated and they shave her down so short. It's not very cute but it's practical. And then it gives us time to work on all of the rest of the stuff we need to work on. And right now she's basically, she's going down and getting a sedated groom every about five to six months. Um, And it's, you know, it's pricier, but also it's not stressful for the dog. Um, And then of course I love nail boards for, you know, if it's, if nails are the issues, get your nail board going. There's no reason why you should fight with your dog for nail trims. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. All right. I feel like there was so much and there's so much more, but it's there's like, so there's much so much more. nuance that it's not like you can, you know, expect to listen to this podcast and train your own dog specifically. Right. But I love right. that we're opening people's ideas to the fact that this is a possibility and, and worth time. It's so, especially, I mean, if, I, I think so often people see young dogs and maybe stressed at the vet and they think they'll just outgrow it. Mm. They don't. And so that is where taking the time to just doing those happy visits. And we see a lot of this actually post spay surgery, post spay or neuter surgeries. So dogs are going to the clinic pretty routinely through their puppydom for vaccines and checkups and all these things. And then they hit that spay neuter age and they have a major surgery and, you know, are over, you know, at the hospital for a long period of time, anesthesia, all that stuff. And the next time they come to the hospital is not until they're like it usually around, you know, a year to 18 months old. It's usually a good, depending on when they spay or neuter, it can be quite some time. And the last time they're in the clinic, it was a pretty stressful event. Yeah. And that's like, I think a critical, and it's like adolescence, critical windows, Mm -hmm. you know, like all of those important things. And like, man, if you're do- like my dog, one of my dogs just had a tooth pulled. And that next week I was at the clinic just going in and saying hi and leaving. Oh, that's I, knew, smart. I knew that that anesthesia, it was hard on her and she was a little stressed out and she's sensitive that way. And so we just went up and did some parking lot puppuccinos and had some fun and that's it. I love it. I love it. Awesome. And I will put some links in the show notes to how people mm-hmm. can get in touch with you. Yeah. Um, and you, it sounds like you have online classes. And- I do. Okay. I do online classes. Um, we ha- I'm doing a coming up with a tricks class where it's like you can take one class at a time and they're regular quote unquote tricks, but they all work in a cooperative care setting. So we're not delving deep into start buttons or anything like that, but just some fun tricks because it's a hot, it's a heavy topic sometimes. And so having fun is really important for me in dog training. So um, we're doing some fun tricks classes. And then I do have my uh, four week foundation cooperative care class. And once you take that, I do, I have started up a membership group that you can join so that oh, you can have, cool. it, have some support going forward. Cause this is a, for many dogs, it's a lifetime project. Absolutely. And so it's easy to lose your way as even trainers, we forget and put things on the back burner. So having the membership group is a nice way to kind of keep you on your toes and keep 
keep working on things. And then, of course, I do uh, private sessions. Thank you, Sarah, for joining me today. My biggest takeaway from this conversation is this kind of training should be a priority for everyone. It will massively improve you and your pet's life. Also, that there is a lot more freedom than I thought there was. Your start button doesn't need to be a chin rest or a sideline position. And if you can't get your pet to like what you need to do, training that gotta do it cue will still make it less stressful for both of you. If you and your pet are running into issues, reach out to a certified force-free professional. And if you want to work with Sarah, check out DecisiveMomentConsulting.com. Thank you for stopping by the dojo to learn with me this week. This is your aspiring sensei, Susan Light, signing off. You can find me at DoggyDojoPodcast.com or I'm Susan Light LA on Instagram, Pinterest, and Facebook. The music was written by Mac Light. You can find him at MacLightSongwriter.com. If you like the show, you can support it by subscribing, sharing it with your friends, rating it, and reviewing it on Apple Podcasts. I'll be back in two weeks with another new episode of of the Doggy Dojo.